Good morning, everyone. Bonjour tout le monde. <laughs> Ça va? Great. Uh, as I was introduced, I'm Liberata Mulam from Tanzania. I try on my French because I lived in the French speaking countries in Burundi. Uh, but um, our moderator, the coordinators, if you do allow me, we are meeting today. This is August the 7th, and we are discussing about East Africa. As I said, I come from Tanzania. So today, we are marking the 21st anniversary of the twin bombing of the US embassies in, Ta in Tanzania, Dar es Salaam, and Nairobi. I know you are all from the military. I cannot ask you to stand up and observe a minute of silence. <laughs> I don't give orders. But I request you, in the silence of your heart, to use this opportunity to remember the victims. We lost more than 200 people, both places. The majority were in Nairobi, about 213. There were more than 4,000 injured, wounded. So this is why when I received the invitation to come here addressing this important topic on countering terrorism, violent extremism, I thought this was quite timely. In more than 20 years or two decades, I think this is the time to be able to assess, make critical evaluation on what has worked, what has not worked, and where do we move from here. So I'm trying to summarize maybe the objective of this <laughs> workshop. I didn't have the opportunity to attend area sessions as my sister here. So in my presentation, if I repeat what you have been discussing for the last two or three days, bear with me. I've been asked to speak about the they call it actions, campaigns, responses to violent extremism, to terrorism at the national, regional, and international level. So when we speak of East Africa, there are always different interpretation basing on now uh, either the regional economic communities, <laughs> or based on the political configuration, geographical configuration by the African Union. So I believe that while, I mean, when we are here and looking at East African community, we look at East African, I mean, East African region, we look at it in a broader context that brings together almost nine countries, extending from Ethiopia, Eritrea, Djibouti, Somalia, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda, and Burundi. I know in the context of the, the subject under discussion, the focus must have been more on Somalia and for understandable reasons. 
my sister, Dr. Michelle Ndiaye, spoke of uh, Amisom. Amisom drew the participation of countries from the region, some of which, like Burundi, when they sent troops, I was then in, uh, in Burundi heading the sub-regional organization, International Conference on the Great Lakes Region. When the Burundi government and the Burundi people started deceiving bodies from Somalia with their wives in tears mourning, the question was, why are we in Somalia? There were a number of uh, explanations been given, but then the government of Burundi was saying we are committed to ensure that there is sustainable peace and security that Burundi fought so hard to achieve, and that Burundi has never been at war with any country, but then they could see that what was happening in Somalia would have serious consequences on that country, given its history, its weak weakness. So I'm giving you this uh, background to say while we are addressing, might be addressing the national strategies, but what I learned by heading this interregional organization, that whatever happens in any of these countries has regional ramification. I don't know whether in the course of this workshop you were able to make a, maybe a survey of what is existing in terms of the number of regional organizations, sub-regional, regional task forces, regional fusion centers, joint verification mechanisms, standby forces, regional brigades. I think this is not accidental. There was, and there is still, a general recognition that to achieve sustainable peace and security and be able to deal with these problems of terrorism and violent extremism, the solutions have to be based on a regional approach. I was here as ambassador when President Obama in February 2015 convened the first summit on countering violent extremism. He invited countries from Africa, from the Middle East, and others to Washington. But as we convened, looking around the room, then everybody was asking, why Tanzania? Why Rwanda is not here? Why this country is not here? Why can't this country is here? Of course, the easy explanation was for Washington, violent extremism 
is targeted. I won't mention what religion. <laughs> but we were looking around the room, we could see that the countries that had the majority of Muslims were in the room. <laughs> One of the scholars wrote an article to say there is no one who was a rebel or was born as a terrorist. He said we are all potential terrorists or potential extremists given the causes, I think you, are, you must have um, interrogated what leads to one to be an extremist, a terrorist. In our countries, and I'm happy, I don't know, is anybody Tanzania, I see our Kenyans, friend, Uganda, oh great. <laughs> so I don't want to be speaking to the converted. But we know that what happened for the first, of course, it was a shock to everybody when you had this first bombing. But currently, even in this country, what is emerging is more domestic. We call domestic terrorism. <laughs> domestic extremisms. So when we met here in 2015, it was the first time people, most at least of the delegates that came from the capitals to hear this concept or term of violent extremism. In our region, what we know are the so-called negative forces, the rebel groups, the insurgents, the assailants, the fundamentalists. So everybody left without actually knowing what this is, what this is all about and, and where it should be based if you come up with a plan of action. Tanzania's delegation was made up of people from the Home Affairs or Department of Interior here. There was nobody from the military, nobody from the intelligence, because they thought this was a police matter. <laughs> and those who deal with the law enforcement are the police. But we know, all know that dealing with extremism, dealing with terrorism, it is of, it's a multifaceted issue or that requires a much prolonged approach and much agents collaboration. So following various attacks, especially in Kenya. I don't know whether you remember, because people, they seem to start from 9-11. <laughs> the Norfolk Hotel attack of 1980. <clears throat> and then the rest followed. But then following those attacks, The first thing that the national government, so national states, thought of, first and foremost, to establish units and terrorism units to have the parliament adopt anti-terrorism acts so that they would have a legal framework because then it never existed. 
So you'll find that from 2003 onwards, countries of the region, they were all attempting to have a national legal framework. And if you have to try the perpetrators, you would have a legal basis. In Kenya, though they were victims, it took a while for their parliament to agree on what kind of this bill would be. But then as they were debating, in 2013, you had another terrorist Westgate Mall. And then quickly, quickly, I think uh, this act was approved. In Tanzania, we had it up, adopted. But then it has been recently, because of what has been going on in the country, the internal dynamics, amended to include a provision of a death penalty for anyone caught with, the, with materials that incite people, anyone caught in this act of terrorism or violent extremism. So what I'm saying here is that the responses have taken mostly these two forms, on law enforcement, on establishing institutions or mechanisms. The same goes from, because I understand yesterday you were talking about uh, all the, I mean, the frameworks, the mechanism that exist under the African Union Secure, Peace and Security Act. So we all rush to establishing this institutional frameworks. The normative, of course, good frameworks and the law. But then, why are we here when we have all the roles? The UN has such a comprehensive counterterrorism strategy, which every country, every member states of the United Nations has to come up with a plan of action. In your invitation, you pointed out that while African governments have acted to confront this escalation, the violent extremism, their responses risk having limited effect without strategic planning, and that the responses to rising extremism have not, been, have not kept pace with the evolving threat. So what I'm saying here, this assumes that these countries or governments, they have the capability to deal with this extremism, but what they lack is a strategic plan. And what would that strategic plan contain other than what maybe already is existing? As a region, there are so many strategies at the level of the um, East African community, IGAD, you mentioned IGAD. In fact, the strength, you mentioned the weaknesses. But the strength of IGAD that brings to all the, most of these countries you've been speaking about is that it was the first regional organization that came up with the conflict early warning mechanism and early response. And for those who have been researching about it, this, they say this is the most advanced. And then other regs followed to have the early warning mechanism as a prevention. But then while so many people have even, many of the scholars have written books about this early warning frameworks and mechanisms, but what we have seen is the missing link between the early warning and the early response. 
So for the people in intelligence, of course, they are good in collecting all this information and then take time to do analysis. So by the time they inform those who take uh, maybe the military, thank God, it's already late. So where that is where the missing link is. But that's where our strength would be. And as I said, everything maybe starts from the national and goes to the regional, the region to the national. So whatever early warning mechanism that exists at the, these regional organizations, they have now units at the national level. So we have, in Tanzania, I think we have a unit. In other countries, they have, uh, but then are they operational? So we have the strengths in terms of having these regional organizations. But the strength which I realized when I was heading the International Conference on the Great Lakes Region was the convening power. But those who have to, they take decisions at highest level, heads of state level. And then I was always reminded that Ambassador Mula Mula, you are so excited that this summit was successful but then you'll be surprised that uh, by the time the heads of state leave, for example, in Nairobi, they get to the airport, they have already forgotten what decisions they have taken. Because after they are done with this summit, then the national priorities <laughs> start weighing on them. And then by the time they get to their respective countries, they find there are other issues more than what brought them maybe to Nairobi. So the issue is always, what are the priorities? What are the national priorities? And at what time? At what, during what administration? <laughs> because when you change the administration, so priorities change. Again, when I was here as ambassador, we had a crisis of the anti-poaching poaching crisis of wildlife. I made a lot of presentation about trying to explain how the elephant population is being decimated. So everyone, that time it was about <laughs> anti-poaching <laughs> as a, a conduit for terrorist activities. So I'm saying this response it depends <laughs> what time frame what administration, what are the priorities? But finally, let me end on this. The Secretary General of the UN was in Nairobi last month. He was uh, addressing the African Regional High Level Conference on Counterterrorism and the Prevention of Violent Extremism Conducive to Terrorism. I don't know whether the outcome of that conference has advised this workshop. <laughs> but I think what you have been discussing is what the Secretary General came up with, but also admitted about the financing aspect that you raised. But you also saw that there were a lot of examples, at least in the African countries, in terms of how we collaborate. But what is missing? was the bottom-up approach to have sustainable solutions. And this is what I want to bring to you. I was in government for many years. I'm now in the academia. When you are talking of the academia, think tanks, they are put in the group, I think, of the civil society. <laughs> but then, how much do you use this rich, rich resources, rich research, to advise the policies. When I went into the academia, I said, oh, we have been shortchanging ourselves <laughs> by not getting that, those research that are gathered us on the shelves of these universities. So my plea to you, and that's why I'm happy that at least you have been able to invite somebody from the academia. You need that. And finally, I'm not marketing this. I have, there's this book that came out in two volumes, Extremism in Africa. 
There was volume one and volume two. Volume one came out last year, and this one was launched at the George Washington University at our African Institute. It has almost all what you've been discussing about. <laughs> and it has been published by the Good Governance Africa, which has a center in Johannesburg and their club for the West Africa. So I'm not saying I'm marketing it, but please get a copy. <laughs> get a copy and all the subjects that you have covered. And the scholars, about 27 scholars have contributed to these two volumes, including about seven from the US and Europe, and of course, majority from Africa. So please make good of this resource. Thank you very much.